In this episode, notorious possession, art as occupation of a foreclosed home. I do what I do because of a commitment to cultural engagement. The workers' rug, day laborers, transforming their working clothes into a collective social sculpture. This rug can become a catalyst for a different way to look at the world. Fallen fruit, a collective whose mapping of public fruit trees challenges ideas of food access and public space. We saw this resource as something that was overlooked and hidden. And Market Makeover, an art and design initiative by the group Public Matters, transforming corner store markets into resources for healthy food. It makes you feel good, you know, gives you a sense of pride, like, yeah, I'm doing something right. Next, on Artbound. My name is Robbie Herbst. I'm a writer with Artbound. When I first heard of Olga's Notorious Possession Project, I was immediately intrigued. She's an artist who in the past has worked with the issue of foreclosure and property ownership. A few years back, her and Andrea Bowers collaborated with Max Rameau, who heads an organization in Miami called Take Back the Land. Take Back the Land is an organization that is interested in seizing foreclosed properties for homeless people to live in. What captivated me about Notorious Possession was Olga's idea that squatting could and should be art. There's the formal element of it as a work of sculpture. She works with color, she works with form, she works with spectacle. Those are traditional items that artists work with. Then beyond that, there's a whole social practice level of the project in that she's doing a project in a neighborhood that is affected by and affects the community around it and is in dialogue with that. So there's at least three levels of complexity that are in the work and all those play off one another in a really vital way. Hi. Hi. Are you the real estate agent? Uh, yes. I work for KCT Television, I'm a, a producer. And uh, we're making a story about this house, actually. Oh, yes? Yeah. Why? It has something? It has been painted gold. Uh-huh. I don't know if you noticed. Yes, I guess. Is, is, is any, 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 any something? No, no, or, no. Or any crooked stuff? <laughs> No. What no. is it? They want to know. Uh -huh. I noticed that, that they painted inside. They put a it's very attractive a... color. <laughs> they have a what do you say? Um, rainbow inside. It's very strange the way they have the house. Uh, an artist actually painted it all gold and painted you know the, the guy? rainbow inside. You know the guy? I know the artist. Oh, oh. that's why. So you've been inside the house? Yeah, it was, I saw, but it was late. But I come in now to see what's uh, what uh, is going on inside. <laughs> How much is the house selling for? Three ninety nine. Since two thousand seven, the city of LA has witnessed over 60,000 foreclosures. The majority of those foreclosures, you see the working class folks who are struggling to stay above water. In Northeast, we do have a significant presence given this crisis we're going through. What we have found is you have an empty house and when the bad guys in the area, those who would take advantage and abuse these locations, end up squatting, using it as dens for drug transactions, taking cars that they steal and they strip. A lot of bad activity occurs. There's no care for the yard. You can see the weeds building up, broken windows, and it becomes almost cancerous to that block. My practice doesn't really bring in financial support. I've been in well-respected exhibitions I've shown internationally. I do what I do because of a commitment to cultural engagement. And that's what most artists are. The kitchen. She has always been interested in these premises 
of the American dream and this myth that if you work hard enough, you can pull yourself up out of your class, prepare yourself into a safe middle class. Myths that especially recently have started to disintegrate for a majority of people. We bought this house four years ago. It was a foreclosed home. It's the first home we ever owned. A week after moving into it and signing the house, my partner was laid off. And so we have been nothing but very, very scrappy and precarious since then. It was really a desperate time. Maybe there is a certain scrappiness that is necessary to survive and proceeded to come up with the idea, maybe we could live there, because that house is much nicer than ours here, and then rent this one out that we owned, and then we could get ahead. I completely believed the house was abandoned. So our idea was to go in there and live. We went over there and went into the house, but actually found out that it was just too uncomfortable to do. There was a box addressed to the previous owner, and it was a box to hold cremains, and that was pretty intense. I bring up this cremation box only because that is the overt link to making art for me, because I felt an obligation to somehow bury it or deal with it. I just hated the idea of it getting thrown in a dumpster when the bank comes in and does a trash out. Where are you folks from? Doesn't matter. It's more important where are you guys from? We're the new owners of this place, and you guys have no right to be in here. Do you have any you documentation of Actually, your yeah, ownership? Please come here. We're, we're going to work it all out. Sounds good. Adverse possession is just sort of an old notion in the law that arises out of the fact that, frankly, at the beginning of time, nobody holds the title to anything. People utilize property, and when they utilize property for long enough, the property is acknowledged within the community to be theirs. And for those reasons, going way back, long before Anglo-Saxon law, there's this notion embedded in sort of communities with respect to the land that it's important to reward use as opposed to some sort of formal title to the land. And that notion in Anglo-Saxon law gets played out in this idea of adverse possession. I wanted to make the entire house an object. So the way to do that was to coat the whole thing in gold. It also became a commodity. And as a commodity, that's the way the market in our culture at this time is working with these houses. You know, it's buying and selling and flipping, and it's to make other people money. And it's kind of losing sight of its function as shelter, as its function as a container of lives. I went kind of in a crass way. We're going to make it gold. We're going to make it shiny. We're going to make it gilded. Since the 60s and 70s, artists have attempted to circumvent predictable art world and art market strategies and structures by taking art outside of the gallery and established museum context. And by doing that, integrating or working with a much wider audience. And they've been doing that by a number of different strategies, art strategies, such as ephemeral and transitory works, site-specific installations, one-off events and actions and performances. Olga's house fits perfectly into this progressive social context. By painting it gold, the house distinguishes itself from other houses, but also calls attention to the number of other foreclosed properties. In my time spending months in there now, I started to notice there was a lot of rainbow paraphernalia and gay pride paraphernalia everywhere. What they put up on the walls was this expansiveness that was beyond their boundaries. I was thinking about what's sort of a joyous signifier of this unbounded sky, and I thought the rainbow. And I also thought about the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The house being the pot of gold and this rainbow was bounding and bouncing through the interior. I think that context in Olga's work is so important. Instead of 
choosing a gallery or an institution of art to produce and present her work. She's choosing a home that is potentially moving into foreclosure proceedings. It's really a site of shifting transitory states. The property rights are in many ways in limbo at various stages in the foreclosure process. Sure. And the question of whose property this is and the moral notions that we have about property become in flux. It'll be interesting to see what the police say. Now, you, you realize we're artists doing a project here. You're aware of that? You know what I do realize? Is that it doesn't matter what you tell me, it doesn't matter what you tell the law enforcement, because you can lie to me. That's, why, that's why we want to make sure law enforcement's here. It's not simply a morality play. She is, in fact, questioning the paradigm, but at the same time, you can't even understand exactly what the paradigm is. Wait, am I in foreclosure? Am I okay to be here? Have you seen the art project? And what's I got to do with anything? Just us as human beings standing on the sidewalk talking, that's all. So you're um, telling me that if you adversely take possession of somebody's property and you alter and deface the property for artistic purpose, that makes it okay, that makes it legally valid, or what? It was abandoned and it neglected. It was abandoned, I see. No, no, it wasn't abandoned. And if it was, what gave you the right to come and take possession? Oh, um, really? Back to last Friday. You know, you got to understand the law, and you guys should have read the notice. Let's see when they come. You don't just come and decide that something that belonged to somebody else is now yours. You don't just make a decision, and you don't alter and deface it either. Once I finished painting, the exterior and the interior. A lot of people from the community and members of the art world have shared consistently with me a lot of problems with the piece, a lot of conflicts around if I'm being exploitative. Artists get to control a lot in their studio and we get accustomed to tying up all the questions and all the content and this one uh, there was just so much out of my control, it's not even funny. So the obvious situation happened. The police came and their supervisor came and removed me. Pretty much she was just cut and dry. She wanted to look for proof that I had lived there. And the fact is I had never lived there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who do you pay rent to? I don't pay rent. Okay. How is it that we all have to pay mortgages and rent and you don't tell me how that happened? This is an artwork that is illuminating issues around the foreclosure crisis and how people are using their houses. Okay, can you show me any type of paperwork that gives you property rights to this residence here? I want you to show me proof as to how and who gave you permission to live in that home. Do you have it? No, I don't have that. Okay, do you understand that you could be arrested for trespassing? You have no legal right into that home. When Olga contacted me, she had a number of issues in play. She had this art project, Notorious Possession. She was faced with potential eviction or arrest or it wasn't clear, but she was very concerned that she was going to lose contact with the project, that she was not going to be able to complete the process that she had begun and immediately it occurred to me that there were issues concerning squatters rights, adverse possession and potentially statutes that protect artists work and the integrity of the work that might be in play here. Ma'am has requested you to be office property. My offices are here and I'm telling you remove yourself from this property you have no legal rights here. I had sewn canvases that were tight-fitting on top so the gold paint can be sprayed on there without damaging the tiles because I knew this was a short-lived project, trying to respect the new owners that eventually were going to come. And I've asked the company that bought it that they would permit me to remove those canvases. That's all I want. The Visual Artists' Rights Act provides protection for work of recognized stature the statute itself defines art as uh, painting, sculpture, prints, and if you really push those definitions so that they take into account contemporary developments in art and culture, then it's an argument that you can definitely make that the entirety of the structure itself is essentially an appropriated found object, appropriated from the foreclosure market, painted gold, 
making it her own. It's appropriation on the scale of real estate. I think the question of ethics in relation to Olga's project is particularly interesting. There's a kind of a naivete and an absurdity to her activity. And within that, I think, is an ethical kernel. And that has to do with thinking about this in a much larger context. If you think about the unethical banking practices and the unethical loan practices and the much larger context of what was happening with the financialization of the economy and the absurdity of that, it's almost as if the psychosis around the economy warrants these minor gestures that do have a kind of strangeness to them. One of the things that I think is interesting to think about in a slightly broader context is what happened to the Occupy movement and the way that within the Occupy movement there was a number of people in many cities, including Los Angeles, who tried to shift from the notion of encampment more towards foreclosure protection. And so I also see what Olga is doing as an outgrowth of and in relation to the Occupy movement, where the violent evictions of the encampments by the police in many cities ended up with people developing more dispersed strategies. And obviously one of the ways that I think that's been successful and people have struggled around is this idea of sort of defending people's homes against foreclosure. Where's your paperwork that entitles you to be in this home? Olga's rights under VARA intersect with her attempt to adversely possess the property. She was evicted, but her work still occupies the property. And it's because of those, much more than the squatter's rights angle on all of this, that we're in negotiations at this point with the owner to get Olga back into the property to allow her to finish and complete documentation and to remove all the works of art which can be removed without damaging the structure as a whole and without destroying the works of art themselves. If Olga recovers the canvases that she has installed on the roof of the house and that she has painted, then I very much hope that I will be able to sell them. I think they are important documents of this performance. The harsh reality is the city cannot be participating in activities that are illegal. Whoever owns interest in that building is in a position to say, why are these folks squatting on our property? But from a pragmatic point of view, you have an empty house that is probably in someone's portfolio and doesn't even know it exists. Now the question is, can we as a local municipal government move fast enough to start bridging these gaps, break through these silos, and start moving in a direction where these homes can now function for what they were truly meant to be, a place for a family to live. I like to write about grassroots underground creative projects going on in Los Angeles. Social practice is a kind of artwork where people come together and they experience something novel between one another. And in that experience, in that moment, is where the art is. Not in the sum of it, but in the happening of it. Speaking with some of the organizers of the Workers' Rug piece and hearing some of the workers' stories, it was very clear to me 
that the workers' rug was a place where the workers could feel feelings that they hadn't felt before. And they could experience ideas in a group and share them with others, and then possibly to transform them. Um, where an, in an individual's experience is woven into a community and is held by that community. And in a way, that becomes a form of power. So the worker's rug is an object and an experience where people are sharing their stories to build something together. And that building is an identity of power as workers. A day liver is a human being that's looking for employment. Whatever employment that human being can get, it's a lot of time spent working and sacrificing their bodies for really low pay. Here at the Downtown Community Job Center, day laborers come at the crack of dawn to look for employment. How that happens here is through a raffle. una camiseta como cualquier camiseta que uso para trabajar y en esta ocasión he decidido compartir el romperla como un símbolo del trabajo. Me gusta pensar en eso, en que el trabajo es algo que transforma a los animales superiores en nosotros, en humanos. La prenda que yo uso para, vez, para trabajar y que después convierto en herramienta, porque también se convierte esto, ahorita va a ser una alfombra, pero se convierte en herramienta porque uso, lo uso como trapos para limpiar. Hay una organización que dice que las trabajadoras del hogar somos hadas madrinas y estoy convencida absolutamente de ser una de tantas hadas madrinas a que equivocadamente muchos llaman trabajadoras domésticas. Y esta es la oportunidad en este momento para decir que solo somos trabajadoras del hogar, asistentes del hogar, hadas, madrinas, que simplificamos la vida de muchos al limpiar su casa, al cuidar sus hijos. Parte de mi vida, parte de mi esencia, parte de lo que nosotros contribuimos como inmigrantes, el trabajo es un derecho y el trabajo siendo un derecho y siendo un acto dignificante se es negado a muchos por su condición de no tener un permiso de trabajo, por estar en un país que ofrece un sueño pero que llegamos y nos empiezan a decir criminales. Dicen que nosotros destruimos la economía, que venimos a dañar y no es así. Nosotros día con día contribuimos a la economía y contribuimos con nuestra cultura y contribuimos con nuestros pensamientos y sentimientos. Y eso va a representar esta alfombra. Mi nombre es Martín Hernández y esta camisa para mí es muy importante porque con esto vamos a hacer un trabajo de 
eh, la alfombra de, de jornaleros, se podría decir. Esta playera, los últimos trabajos, ha sido en el sol, descargando containers. Y la mera verdad, no es muy pagado y, y muy matado. Y, y, y llenas de sudor y todo. Más que ya, la, ya está limpia, fui a la barra. Mi nombre es Ricardo Rodríguez, soy jornalero del Centro de Downtown, del Instituto de Educación Popular del Sur de California. Y para mí es muy significativo esta reunión porque precisamente se enfoca en, en la vida de los jornaleros, en los trabajos que realizamos cotidianamente y que nos da la oportunidad de expresar de comunicarnos con el mundo, de quiénes somos y qué estamos haciendo en este país, participativamente como trabajadores y como gente integrada dentro de un sistema social. Va a ser para algo bueno. Esta camisa que, es, que estoy poniendo aquí tiene 10 años conmigo. He hecho bastantes trabajos con ella. Este, de pintura, mi trabajo es de construcción, de pintura, la he metido a la, a la pintura, he hecho este, trabajos de estaco con ella. Para mí porque este es un proyecto que, que cada uno de que va a poner una prenda es para, es, este, es como que va a poner uno un poco de uno de, de, lo, de lo que uno hace, de lo que uno hace este diario, este de los trabajos que uno, uno realiza, ¿verdad? Y no sé, no, no sé dónde vaya, dónde vaya a quedar a la alfombra, pero donde quiera que vaya, los que participe va, va a tener una parte de cada uno de nosotros que vamos a participar. Sí, por favor, sí. no tomemos fotos, por favor. Sí, yo me llamo Luis y tengo tres hijos. Y nosotros vivimos en Arizona por ocho años. Eh, Arizona es un estado muy difícil, muy duro de vivir. Es inhumano por el clima, es inhumano por las leyes, es inhumano por, por la forma de vivir allá. Entonces, esta camisa yo la usé cuando trabajaba en la construcción. Y también trae recuerdos de cuando mi familia se empezó a separar. Trae recuerdos de cuando terminé siendo papá soltero por cinco años ya, al día de hoy. Con mis hijos a un lado, siempre. Y trae muchos recuerdos de tristeza, dolor, sufrimiento, de mucho trabajo. Y de sobrevivencia, más que nada, de sobrevivencia trae mucho, mucho recuerdo. Y para mí es importante venir y poderla romper porque siento que es un proceso de sanar, de sanar ese dolor, esas tristezas y agradecer también, agradecer porque pues de todo eso se aprende, de todo eso crecemos, de todo eso aprendemos a ser mejores seres humanos. Aquí estamos en Los Ángeles, aquí estamos luchando, aquí estamos aún teniendo esa, esa lucha diaria para ser mejores, para, para crear un futuro mejor para nosotros y para los que tenemos atrás, en este caso serían nuestros hijos. Our clothes are what often create a visual identity of who we are and what we're working on. If there's paint on my clothes, if I have a collar or a suit, and this is an opportunity to take that off rip it up and put it back together very closely, intimately tied to another person's history. So this is Bernardo's story and Pedro's story and Jade's story and they're all together in this rug. And people have said that maybe someday the rug is going to be the size of this room or the size of Los Angeles as we keep on collecting our stories. 
we wanted the fabric that goes into the rug to represent the people that, that put it in there. And who do we want to represent? Who needs representation? Who are the undocumented? Who are the unrecognized? We thought a lot about uniforms and colors of uniforms and blue collar workers and white collar workers and what color clothing people were wearing to do their labor in the city. Perhaps all of these colors of uniforms could be in one rug and that, that rug then becomes a city, it becomes a space. And we're also in an economic crisis, we're in a recession. A lot of parts of LA are in a literal depression. So we need to talk about work, recreate meaning through work, support our families through work. When they rip a shirt, they take out all that they have inside. Maybe they haven't expressed it any other way, but this is their chance to do it, right? This is their chance to tell their story and also rip that. And I feel that there's a lot of healing that comes with sharing a story, but also physically just tearing that. I was able to do that a couple of minutes ago and I felt really good. Take that, cafe. <laughs> People aren't necessarily always going to feel invited or welcomed into a museum for various reasons. And so the idea being that we can engage with audiences kind of in their everyday environments where they naturally gather. One of the highlights for me personally was an opportunity that we had to bring a group of members from EDEFSCA to the museum. For a lot of them, it was their first time ever stepping foot inside of a museum. And it was just a great way for us to build a relationship with the members of EDEFSCA and show that it's a two-way street of us going out into the community, but also inviting people and letting them know that CAFAM is a space that is meant for them as well. I feel like art can provide this other avenue of social change. Sometimes the art object itself, like this rug, can become a catalyst for a different way to look at the world. I'm seeing my role as one of a facilitator and mm -hmm. facilitating these conversations. We're helping to facilitate a different way of looking at each other in the city. And in the end, it was really important for us to just make this project about relationship building and time spent and sharing authorship and allowing ideas to evolve and letting go. We don't want the rug to sit on a floor, being something that's traditionally sort of trampled over, walked over, overlooked. We want the rug to hang on a wall to visually confront the viewer and propose questions about what is this, where did this come from. My name is Janet Owen Driggs. I'm an artist and a writer. I first encountered Fallen Fruit when they were doing a fruit jam and they'd taken their practice out, out of the, the gallery space into the street and they were making jam. Then I discovered their fruit maps and became intrigued by the idea of public fruit. Fallen Fruit's Del Air Fruit Park is the thin end of the wedge in policy terms. I think it was a real challenge for everyone involved to bring public fruit, publicly accessible, publicly tended fruit into a public park. And that's something that hadn't been done before. This is just a, you know, a little insertion to have everyone be thinking about art and parks and people and food in a different way. Because what they're saying is not we have to strive harder to be over there. We have to run faster. We have to fight harder because there's not enough. They're saying there's enough. There's abundance. We have enough to share and give and not worry about protecting our little corner. And I'm hoping that this will resonate and there will be more and more changes and the wedge will drive in further and ultimately we will have a city where there's public fruit and public celery and public cauliflower in all of our unused spaces. Fill it up. Look, these are, are these Meyer? No, oh, whoa. Look at that. It's up, man. Are they? Yeah, they're great. Here. They this are. This one's uh, cracked, so you can smell it. Oh, wow. They're Meyer lemons. Oh, my God, it's incredible. It smells so deliciously yeah. great. Yeah, excellent. 
fruit became our operative symbol very quickly. Once we started looking at it, we realized we had this amazing thing, which is, here's my fruit. This piece of fruit is almost always a positive symbol. It never has a bad meaning, and it has a very universal currency among different kinds of people, different generations, different cultures, different historical periods. This is a remarkably consistent object. There's an amazing orange around the corner here. All right, let's get some oranges. Yeah, okay. Let's do it. We looked at our own neighborhood in Silver Lake in Los Angeles and thought about the fruit trees we were seeing unpicked in public space or in the margins of public space. And we were especially noticing that nobody was walking in the neighborhood. You would get into your car and drive three blocks to go to a grocery store to get an apple or an orange. So we saw this resource as something that was overlooked and hidden. So we made a map, we wrote a manifesto, and we took a bunch of great, silly photographs of us picking fruit. The result of that document was the beginnings of Fallen Fruit. Fallen Fruit is a art collective where we look at fruit and we use fruit as a material by which we can reimagine the world around us. We think of fruit trees as guardians of a city in a different way. They're something that always provides a symbol of generosity and a sense of aesthetics, a sense of warmth and community without asking for anything back. We became very interested in the object that we found, which is this fruit, and we very quickly we started calling it public fruit, which is a kind of funny coinage, but what we want to talk about is property and who does the fruit that is growing in public space belong to, and that always leads you to the question of who's the public. And a lot of our work has worked between those two poles, the actual fruit and the people who use it, people who live with it, the people who share it. One of the things that's really interesting about fruit trees in public space is that they exist in pretty much every city in the world and they are always on the edge of legality. They're in a gray zone of law in most cities. There's only two cities in North America that actually have it permissible to plant fruit trees in public space, Guadalajara in Mexico and San Francisco. I think a fruit tree is as dangerous as any other tree is, and I don't think they're that dangerous. I really think that we should open our minds to the idea that fruit trees could be beneficial. Instead of going through a drive through and getting french fries, why don't you go drive by a fruit tree and get a delicious tangerine? It's better for you. You could get one for your friend too, and it's free. Mm. It's really what is good. It? Orange? Mm, no, I think it's a tangerine. Where fruit is picked on public sidewalks, on public rights of way, there's a certain ambiguity as to whose property, in fact, this is. So while there is the general understanding that you can simply pick fruit that overhangs a sidewalk, I think it's not quite that clear. That said, I don't think landowners need to worry that there are going to be roving bands of fruit gangs that are going to be taking overhanging fruit. But it's an interesting aspect of what fallen fruit is doing. Is it possible to start creating opportunities and situations that transforms policy, that changes the experience of a place by rethinking what's legal? Is it possible to create a public resource in a public place that doesn't want anything back from the public? What if the city was a place that was always abundant? What if it was a place that always offered something to you just because you're there? The LA County Arts Commission approached us to submit a proposal for the Del Air Park where they wanted a piece of public art, they wanted it to be green, they wanted it to serve the community. We've been working for many years with this idea of making these public fruit orchards, either using leftover space in an existing park or plots of land in the city that just have nothing on them and planting fruit trees there and making that a public park, making it accessible to everyone. Public art creates a sense of place. It incorporates the values of a community into public spaces that we can enjoy for generations to come. So while this is a conceptual project, it's also a really practical project. People like to eat fruit, they like to make jam, they like to cooperate with their neighbors. We make art using fruit as a common denominator to change the way that you think about the world. 
In the 1930s and 40s, you saw a lot of these massive federal works projects, and it was really tied into sort of this nationalistic movement of this very powerful nation that can control nature. You know, you had single purpose projects like the Los Angeles River, the channelization of Los Angeles River, 52 miles of concrete. And now they're reevaluating the, the functionality of the river. Yes, we can have flood control, but we can also have habitat, we can have recreational opportunities, we can have economic development. And I think people are looking at public spaces in the same way. In the case of Del Ar Park, it was a unique opportunity because it was a site that actually had included in part of the reconstruction of that park, of course, putting in new trees. And so we propose and promote the idea of planting fruit trees in this park as a form of artwork. We were basically able to use the understanding that fruit trees simply were the material by which we were working as artists, that we actually don't make sculpture and we don't do stamped cement and our messaging doesn't need a lot of verbal language, so we don't need to have a mural or a testimonial. All that we really need to do is have the organic living matter as an example, and the fruit trees would do what they naturally do, which is make fruit, and then people will naturally do what fruit trees want you to do to them, which is pick them. One of the hurdles fallen fruit had in being permitted to do this work was to overcome the concern that work related to fruit could fall within the area of nuisance. There's concerns by cities or municipalities that if they take certain actions that this may make a hazardous condition more appealing and therefore an unsuspecting child or even adult could put themselves in harm's way. A child could climb a tree to pick an apple and may fall. Whether that would happen and whether that makes a fruit tree any more dangerous than another tree is an open question, but in our litigious society where one sues and can be sued for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all, it's a legitimate concern. Fruit's never gonna argue back. It'll never argue back with you. You can get it as angry as you want with a banana, and the banana's gonna be okay with that. The county and the city and the state all have their rules and regulations. That's just the reality of it. That being said, there's always creative ways to create opportunities in parks. The work that a group like Fallen Fruit does would fit perfectly within the mission of California State Parks because it is an art form, it's an educational opportunity, and what they're doing is they're actually helping us to tell a story in terms of the importance of the Healthy Food Initiative within the state of California, which is very focused now on the childhood obesity epidemic and tying people into locally sourced fruit. So having groups outside of state parks who have an expertise in that and teaching things through art is a great avenue to engage local youth. So we think that's a tremendous opportunity here at, at California State Parks in, in Los Angeles. The idea of this fruit park is more about getting people to think about what an important role publicly accessible fruit can and should play in our public environment in LA. We used to be all orange orchards, and here we are struggling with healthy food options when we have a solution right in front of us as a community, which is we could have fruit trees everywhere. So the park is not only a physical manifestation that I feel very confident people are going to enjoy for generations to come, but it's certainly a way to get people to think about how to address healthy food options in our communities. I'm excited that we were able to work on this project. I'm proud of it because it was a collaboration in the true meaning and spirit of collaboration. And it took the County of Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County Arts Commission, it took the Department of Water and Power, Parks and Recreation, as well as the Neighborhood Council of this particular neighborhood, the parks staff at this particular location, to all really come together and not negotiate in such dogmatic terms, but really cooperate and find inspiration in each other's ideas and choices and preferences to move this whole thing forward. With a market makeover, what we're trying to do is introduce quality fruits and vegetables in areas where they don't have it. So we partner with corner stores because there's an abundance of small stores in areas and a lack of large comprehensive grocery stores. That partnership isn't just a partnership with the store, it's a partnership with the community. So it's a partnership with schools, with youth, with local organizations to transform the store 
but most importantly to transform the food environment. Our background is first and foremost as, as visual artists and visual thinkers. So when I say that we're bringing creativity to these issues, it comes from that. And any project that we do has a particular look and feel that you know, uses those visual strategies. It's no accident that, say, we're doing bus posters that look very different than any kind of public health campaign that anybody else does. And it's also no accident that what we take pride in is that we hear comments like, oh, I saw you on that poster down the block, because it's the community representing itself. That's part of the idea of like social practices, really social engagement. It's a long-term relationship with a community where we're involved in a dialogue. We're not the ones setting the dialogue. We're, we're help facilitating it, but the terms unfold as the work unfolds. My, my dad used to work at a fast food restaurant and uh, I get fast food for free all the time. So, you know, that's not really healthy. <laughs> Because, you know, I, I don't remember being taught about food when I was a kid, you know, about vegetables and fruits. I just ate what was given to me. My family has, we have everything. We have heart disease, we have cancer, lung disease, obesity, diabetes. You know, that's all that runs through all of my family. Eating healthy is like a word, way to start to prevent that, you know, so the younger generation won't get it. So one, one of the problems that we have with corner stores and what we call food swamps, or these are generally urban communities, low-income urban communities that have poor access to healthy fruits and vegetables, is the, the common venue for food purchasing in these food swamps is the corner store. And they oftentimes don't offer lots of fruits and vegetables, if any at all. And so we work with the store owners so that they not only uh, can supply fruits and vegetables for for um, purchasing and consumption, but that they also can get them at low cost so the community can afford them. The market makeover is a really comprehensive approach to addressing healthy food access. It's, um, it's about working with young people to bring fresh and healthy food um, to existing corner markets to transform them so that uh, they can offer healthy food retail. Got involved with Public Matters about, it's been up about three years now, almost. They approached us doing this project, the market makeovers, and the uh, principal approached me about the possibility of, of having an elective, uh, an elective course, like a food justice course, to connect the work that Public Matters is doing with the students here at Roosevelt High School. What they're doing right now is, is some of the signage that's gonna go on inside one of the markets, inside the Euclid market, so it says fresco or fresh, and that's going to go that's going to that's going to go directly on top of um, the 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 produce refrigeration that's going to go inside the market. The idea behind it is that when someone walks into the into the market, you're going to have this big fresco sign, very colorful, um, that's just just going to jump out at folks that walk into the market. We had to reorganize the whole inside because walking in, there was this big wall of chips. And so we had to get rid of that. And then we've also been decorating the outside. It was very plain before, and you want to make sure that you can actually notice the store. One of the stores we opened was right down the street from a senior center. And then it's really nice having them come up to you, thanking you that they don't have to go so far, you know, to get their vegetables and their fruits because it's right down the street. So it's actually, it makes you feel good, you know. Gets you a sense of pride like, yeah, I'm doing something right. I remember my mom, she used to go to Trader Joe's. So we would drive all the way to Whittier City just to get some type of healthier um, food. And now it's just like, oh, I need to look for something healthier around here. And this is an example where like, it needs to be in a walking distance from families in this neighborhood. In order for these market makeover interventions to work, the corner store owner, the market owner, needs to see him or herself as an asset for the community. Otherwise, these projects won't sustain. 
and they'll continue to sell liquor and lottery tickets and cigarettes, um, which brings in a lot of foot traffic but doesn't make the community healthy. Bringing healthy food into the community and possibly impacting the community in a way that we really didn't know was possible. Um, trying something new, putting fruits and vegetables in the front versus the junk food. So it sounded like a great idea and we went for it. The difference of a little bit of paint, moving things around, it even looks larger. Um, people have been already purchasing fruits and vegetables more than we did before. One of the things that we do after the stores are transformed is we want to make sure that we help promote the store in the community so that people know about it. Often the, the hardest thing is the time after the transformation because there's all this energy that goes into transforming the stores, all this work, and you can't just leave it once it's done. Um, because it's a, if you bring the fruits and vegetables, it doesn't necessarily mean that people will come. They need to know that it's here. So we do a fairly extensive effort at social marketing to make sure that community members know that the store has been transformed. It offers a wider range of options um, for families and particularly healthier options. So this is part of the ongoing science, which is to try to understand what impact uh, these stores are having on the health behaviors. So this is, we're not quite done with the data collection, but what we've been observing early on in some of our preliminary data is that it is having a change. We're seeing changes in the way that patrons, these are the people who frequent these corner stores, as well as community residents who may or may not frequent the stores, that they're starting to change their eating behaviors as a result of what's being sold in the stores, but also as a result of the social marketing that we're doing as part of the transformation. When Public Matters designs a program and works with communities, we make sure that we're working with young people and developing kind of a cadre of, um, of leadership from within the community. We want to make sure that when the funding goes away, there is a lasting legacy of greater capacity for leadership, um, creativity, and social justice within, within these communities. Dying on the embers of a fire that must be allowed to die. The bed of cold, it must run cold in time. But your body heat, it brings life. A God made from a God, let you eat spirit word be divine. If vultures can be so birds, let it die. Leaning on the everlasting side. i 
sorry, you create monstrous men. From the ink that clots your pen. Pardon on a sentence that must end. So your soul can rise again. If vultures can be sober, let it die. Leaning on the everlasting side, side, side. can be sober, let it die. Leaning on the everlasting side. If altars can be sober, let it die. Oh. Leaning on the everlasting side. Everlasting sigh. 